今天看起来人少了一些，呃，待会不知道会不会再进来啊？那我们直接到我们就照我们的课表开始。那今天有三个数字模式应用的一个课程。那第一个课程将由呃，跟你帮我们讲这个这个美国常常发生的这野火对积水区泥沙传递的一个问题。那第二个课程就会由我们。呃，用来帮我们介绍另外一个哪个主题啊？啊，水库泥沙淤积的问题。那最后的部分，压手部分就是 Scott 会跟我们讲他的三轨桥梁冲刷的一个案例展示。好、哦，那在时间很短暂，不可能让我们都学会怎么去操作。可是经过他的展示，你可能知道他的模式可以做哪些分析。那后续应用就看大家的功力了。那如果有需要，当然也可以需求我的协助了，我会尽量帮大家解决。那接下来不多讲话的，就是把时间交给我们的第一堂课的讲师，呃、嗯，对，这是第一位包贝。Research project that we've just been doing over the that we just began over the past year. So, um, and in the presentation, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of wildfires and, and some some stats. Um, what in particular is Reclamation interested in, and in, in, like in terms of wild wildfires, um, what type of effects wildfires have on um, runoff and state uh, sediment yields, and what we're actually doing. In terms of like、uh, SRH, what are we doing to be able to、um, address the questions that we have? And then I'll just briefly touch on some, you know, kill data、um, campaigns that we we actually do. So wildfires,、um, some basic definitions. So what the type of fires that we're interested in are unplanned fires that burn in natural areas, right? So we're we're really interested in, in fires in forests. Grassland, and I took this blurb from the、uh, U.S.、Um, Forestry Service webpage. We described them as a force of nature that can be nearly、um, impossible to prevent and difficult to、um, control, just like hurricanes and tornadoes. And I, I find it interesting. You know, we say that they are、um, nearly impossible to prevent, and we really shouldn't be preventing wildfires because. Wildfires are actually part of the、uh, the natural ecosystem, right? So、uh, these ecosystems actually typically have like a fire regime, and depending on the type of vegetation, depending on the climate, you know, these these are things that tend to occur naturally、um, on the scale of decades to centuries, and it's it's a, the system's way of、um, rejuvenating itself. So.、Um, Our, our role is how do we minimize its impact to us in the short term because it's a long-term benefit to all of us. So, what are the causes of wildfires?、Um, naturally, the the leading causes of wildfires actually, we have lightning and anthropogenic causes,、um, and、um, unfortunately, anthropogenic causes seem to make up the the major major cause right now. So. Um, that's something that we need to work on. But lightning, lightning is the most,、um, uh, the most, I guess, the usual way in which you tend to have natural, natural wildfires.、Um, some stats, I think, you know, obviously it's a worldwide issue. A lot of people are impacted by wildfires.、Um, in terms of What's important to us is, and what we are noticing is, because of changing climate, right, the size and the frequency of these wildfires are growing due to more extreme weather. So we are, we're seeing more、um, hotter, drier conditions, which are promoting these wildfires. And as as an example, in Colorado, within the past three years alone. 
we, we've seen three of the largest wildfires on record, right? So that's a very typical issue and a very important issue for us right now that we are actually trying to trying to address. And I have a question here. Wildfire is friend awful. Well, like as I was saying, it is a very natural phenomenon it's, and if we do need it, um, it's nature's way of allowing the old to die out and the young to grow. Um, and so, you know, when you have fires, you have nutrients that return back to the soil um, and maintain the soil health. You have um, improved microbial activity, you have younger, stronger um, uh, vegetation that, that, can, that can grow. But then in terms of its impact to us, right, we also have poor, poor air quality, threat to life, threat to infrastructure. And, um, I've, you know, I have the last, last um, bullet point here, there is a risk of flooding and erosion that goes with it. And that is where we come in, in terms of re reclamation. That's, that's, that's the, that's the um, effect that we're interested in. So just showing a few pictures, these are pictures that we've taken from, I mean, these, these are pictures from the last three years. Uh, I think this, uh, this is from Willow Creek. So this, this is uh, from a fire that occurred in 2020. We tend to have all these like debris flows, map flows, I mean, we have stores of sediment that are released, which then when it rains, are easily transported down, you know, downstream to, uh, to our reservoirs. I'm just showing a few here. This is a mud slide. Um, this is from 2021, the Grizzly Fire, um, showing disruption um, on the interstate. Also from the Grizzly Fire. And uh, this is really a creek. Uh, this is from the Willow Creek watershed, showing considerable you know, um, amounts of sediment delivered into the streams. And, and so, uh, just, just showing you, so when it rains after these fires, you have like these huge concentrations, I mean, what's with like huge concentrations of sediment that is transported down the stream. And it's like, you can just tell just by looking at it from the colors, like really, really um, dark brown. So the, the, the main question we have with this research is, well, how is, I mean, if you have a wildfire, um, how are our reservoirs going to be impacted, right? If we have a lot of material coming down, from, from our standpoint, you know, it's, it's going to really impact um, the storage volumes, and so we need to manage this. And uh, this, this is just a picture from the Pioneer Reservoir saying, I mean, are we going to have uh, an instance like this where our reservoirs are going to be filled up? And if, 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 we, um, if we do, how do we manage it? So, the, the whole goal of this um, this project is to, to address these, these, these questions. So what happens when, when you have a fire? Um, there's several things that lead to the, uh, the increase in runoff and the increase in erosion, right? So first off, you, you have vegetation cover removal, right? So that protection that you get when it rains in terms of surface cover is lost. Um, you don't have water, water can be captured, you have less water um, being stored in the canopies and being allowed to evaporate. Um, you also have removal of material, surface roughness, and so whenever you have any runoff, it doesn't slow down, it doesn't have, get, have a chance to infiltrate it, which means you can have more surface runoff. And then also, you have, actually also have changes in the chemical properties of the top layer of the soil. And um, usually after a fire, what happens is the, uh, the soil water dependency goes up. And so when you have rainfall, you, you, get, you typically tend to have more, more runoff, right? This is trying to show, show that to some of the filters here. Also, um, fire affects several things. You have soil degradability changes, right? So the fire burns the organic matter in the soil, and the soil structure typically the, the stability of soil structure typically is dependent on the organic matter, so you have breakdown. And this picture is actually a real picture. This is from a prescribed burn um, that I got from Shibito, um, showing the, the change. This is a marked change in the, uh, 
the soul, um, soul aggregates. You clearly see a breakdown of the soul aggregates, and it's, it's usually very easy to once once you have that breakdown, it's very easy to transport material. It also affects snow, right? So you have the the char and you have the ash that you know darkens the snow, and that affects snow ablation processes. So what happens is you have this less reflectance. Uh, you have more uh, more energy coming into the snow. Snow is very e easier to melt. Snow snow melts earlier, it melts faster. You also you have a release of material, and also um, the bed patterns. So the bed patterns of the uh, fire also affects connectivity of the landscape, right? So now all of a sudden you have pathways for water to move more faster on, on the landscape. So all these factors, it, it's easy to understand why right after fire we, you know, we have the expectation that we're going to have an increase um, runoff or erosion, right? So, but it's the factors have changed. There is a risk. The question is, do we really see this increase in runoff or erosion, right? And, and the answer, it turns out, is not straightforward. So in 2011, um, there was a study done by Smith et al. Um, that looked at a wide range of watersheds of different sizes, right? So they looked at the, the um, first year post-fire uh, segment yield. And I should say this. So usually when you have a fire, the, the, t the time frame where you're most likely going to have an impact is the first first. Uh, once three years, that's when you see an impact. After that, the system is all the system tends to recover. So they they looked at the um, the the sediment yields. I mean, a wide range of sediment yields. So what they, they found out was that post fire exports actually um, sometimes you have high loads, and sometimes you have. I mean, you don't see any changes at all. So the sediment yield does not always increase as, as we expect. And the question is, is this why, right? Okay. And just, just to uh, highlight the point. So this is uh, data that's in print. This is data from the Cash Creek. Um, watershed in California, and it's unfair from actual observing. So what, what we see, or what, what, was, what, what was seen was, post-fire, the sediment concentration and runoff increased, right? So the red line is higher. I mean, for a given amount of uh, flow discharge, you have a higher sediment discharge. So the sediment concentration increased, but then if you looked at the yield over the year, you actually had less sediment yield in the year post-fire compared to the previous year. The, the reason for that was that um, we had less runoff, right? Because of the storm patterns, you had less runoff post-fire than pre-fire. So even, even though you had more sediment coming per, per unit volume of water, you just had less water coming through. Right, so the sediment yield is not automatic, it's, it depends on several things. So, and this, this is where um, our, you know, model like SRHW and things come in. That the actual yield depends not just on the changes in the soil properties, it depends on, for example, the storm that occurs after the fire, right? What type of intensities do you have? Where is it? Where is it raining? Um, what magnitude? You know, it's the, there's a spatial heterogeneity, and and that that actually controls what happens. So you, the impact and the connectivity of your watershed is it is it a natural watershed that tends to store material, um, and so you have a lot of storage. So even though you have a release of release of material from the fire, does it, it doesn't travel, that material is not able to travel all the way down to the reservoirs. Um, and also, yes, you had fires. I mean, how severe was the fire? I mean, was it a high intensity, a low intensity? All of that affects um, the changes in the properties. And all of these are spatially variable, right? So um, to be able to answer the questions that we want, 
are we going to see an increase in sediment water to reservoirs? We need to be able to account for all of these factors and also account for the spatial and temporal heterogeneity that comes with those. So how do we determine post-fire sediment yield, yields at a reservoir? Well, we need to, to, to use the right tools, right, to be able to predict all of this. And um, Young um, yesterday went through the different types of models he had, that the, uh, the benefits of using a physically based model that is distributed, right, truly distributed, and that is the only way that you can actually get to a point because of the, the very natural variability in, in all the factors that's, 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 that, that's at play. That's the only way that you can really do it. And the, the, good, the benefits of this approach as well, if we go in and we also, on top of everything, we also have management activities, um, you have a model that you can actually use for true prediction, right? So you can really predict what's, what's going on um, uh, with, with, the, with your uh, management. So our goal with this um, project is we're, we're taking SRHW, the current SRHW that we have, right? It has a limitation. We don't, we haven't developed it in the past to actually account for higher processes. And so what our plan is to incorporate the effects of fire into the model and then use that to be able to predict you know, the ecologic and response from fires. And in terms of fire, we're looking at, well, how do we represent the, uh, the induced stormwater, uh, the induced soil water ability? We're figuring out a way to, to incorporate that. We also have given out to be able to incorporate the change in soil erodibility um, from the fires and also the landscape hydraulic connectivity, the impact that the, the, the burn distributions have. And then once we're done with that, we're going to validate the model um, with the data from two watersheds that we, we, um, we have data. We already have data from Cash Group. This is an ongoing data um, campaign in Willow Creek. Uh, that, that has been going on right after the fire. And I think it's in its third year, they're it 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 still collecting data, so we'll have a lot of data to do it. Um, so, the, the first thing we're looking at is soil water repellency. Usually, uh, when people try to model post fire effects, what they do is they go in and then they change the soil hydraulic connectivity, which is a gravity favorable process, right? But it's slow, slowly um, we're beginning to realize that it's not necessarily the hydraulic conductivity that's the most significant factor here, but the, the solctivity. So there's a, um, there's a, I don't know if you can see this, I wish I had a pointer, but um, so Evel and Moody, they looked at data, right, they looked at the hydraulic conductivity and the solctivity for, for um, soil samples from different areas, so fire affected areas and um, areas that were not affected by fire. And what, what this really shows, what this really shows is, I mean, if you look, so these are clusters, uh, the, the top cluster is for unburned soils, the bottom cluster is for um, burned soils, and then we have ash data up here. And what, what you see is, well, if you look at the range of hydraulic con conductivities, they all tend to fall within the same range. But then if you look at the solctivity, you start to get like a, a difference, right? So unburned um, soils uh, tend to have a higher solctivity than burned soils. And that's where your your uh, soil water ability comes in. So Shalito et al. They've been looking at a way to represent this, and they they with confess principles. They've come up with a relationship that relates um, different different parameters to the um, solubility. And what, what they found is that fire, while well, fire affects the, uh, the, 
the contact angle that the soul makes, you know, that you have at the surface. So um, the larger or the smaller your contact angle, the more infiltration that you have. But um, fire increases the contact angle such that you have increased soul activity. And part of the, the, the work that they're doing is to try to be able to quantify this. So they, they, they're looking at, this is work being done by the US Corps of Engineers. They're looking at um, coming up with a way of quantifying soil activity for different types of very severities and different types of soils. And how, what then we can do is to incorporate that into the, the, uh, the infiltration relationships that we have. So that we're actually proposing a way to incorporate it into the green and the infiltration equation, which we already have in SLHW. And so once we have that information, all, all we have to do then is for different brain intensities and different soil types, we can just specify the chimneys and soil activity, which then we can use to account for the soil water repellency changes uh, whenever it rains close to fire. Right. So that's, 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 that's one thing we're doing. Um, Soil erosion, unfortunately, yes, and the research for this is, is lagging behind the, the water component. So this is very much an active area of research. Um, I already showed this, this, this plot. We, we know there's a significant impact. We know there's, there's uh, an impact on soil erodibility. And so we've been uh, talking with, with our colleagues um, at the Corps of Engineers and they're actually planning to do several experiments on the brain and non brain plots um, and try to tease out the natural processes processes of the causes of the change in um, soil stability and erodibility by different um, different mechanisms. So rain splash, flow shear, and then from there try to come up with a, uh, a mechanistic way of representing um, erodibility changes in erodibility that we can then incorporate into our um, erosion relationships uh, within, within a model. And then we, we're also looking at um, landscape connectivity, right? How are we going to address this in the model? And here the issue, and hopefully I can convey what the most of the studies that are done to look at the changes in the properties close by are done at the plot scale, right? But we're interested in what actually happens at the larger scale, right? What happens at the hill slope scale, how's material being transferred into the, into, the, into the channel, and from the channel all the way down to our reservoir. So we need a way of bridging that gap between the experimental studies that have been done and sort of scaling everything up. And several studies have actually looked at this. Um, there's been talk of using the uh, hydraulic connectivity function, which uses remotely sent data to look at the, the spatial patterns of um, band severity, different, different band severities and then to relate that to the run of coefficient. So you're able to take uh, sort of the pixel scale data and then relate it to a run of coefficient at larger scales. Um, I, yeah, you don't have to worry about the, the actual equation, but pretty much so that's, that's a function that weights the run of generation potential along, along um, flow pathways. And I, I guess this explains a little bit better. Um, so, this is a uh, sort of a thought, you know, a virtual hill slope that um, I created just to, to illustrate the point. All these hill slopes that you see have the same area of burn, so it's like 50% of the area is burnt, right? But you have different spatial patterns. And if you calculate the um, hydraulic co uh, connectivity value, you see you, you have different numbers. You know? The higher the number, the more likely, the, the, the higher runoff that you, should, you expect. So what, what we're noticing is that the closer the bend area is to your outlet, so the closer the bend area, the, the, I guess the, the larger the receiving area of that, you know, that bend area, the more likely you're going to have runoff. And, then, and so once you're able to incorporate this into your, into your model, 
you can adjust the, the amount of kind of like a mesh cell, for example, based on its, uh, its size to account for how much runoff you'd likely get if you have burn versus if you don't have burn. Um, and you can, and that also, you're also able to account like for the burn intensity, you're also able to account for like the, it's like an aggregated um, factor that accounts for the burn factor as well. Yeah, the only thing, I guess that the thing though is that hydraulic connectivity really is, is a factor only up to a certain storm magnitude, right? So when you have a very large storm, it doesn't matter anymore because naturally they're still going to have a large amount of runoff anyways. Um, but we, we are yet to develop the, sort of the relationships to come out with more universal relationships that we can then incorporate into a model um, to represent this, this effect. So, um, yeah, I'm talking with uh, colleagues from the US called called engineers and we're going to try to figure that out. So in terms of model validation, um, we're, like I said, we're looking at two, two watersheds, the Cash Creek watershed. I, I think this, this watershed was in the, uh, the, 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 the publication, right? Oh, was it clear creek? That was, oh, it was, it was, okay. So this is, this is a watershed in, in Northern California um, that also was burned. Um, we had a, a high, high percentage of the watershed that's burned. 282 square kilometers. And we have data that's available. So we, we have flow and sediment flood data before the fire and after the fire. Um, and so we're able to use that and look at, you know, the fire effects, understand what's going on from year to year. Um, so that, this is one, um, one watershed that we're looking at. And then the, the last watershed, uh, the last, uh, what, the second watershed that we're looking at, that's not too far from us in um, Denver. And so, so there's somewhere around here, it's uh, north, uh, northwest of us. So in 2020, um, we had the Willow Creek fire, which burned about 90% of the of the watershed, right? We had different different burn severities, and we uh, because it's close to us, we actually um, took the opportunity to start collecting data. So. We, we have a reservoir there at the end of the, um, the watershed that we've been doing repeat surveys um, to try to capture some of the type of material that's coming down to see if there are any changes in, in the storage of the watershed. Um, and we, we're working with different, um, different agencies as well to collect uh, water fluxes coming down we also have stability sensors in there that are going, um, collecting data at frequent intervals. And so we, we're actually not just looking at, we've got the two watersheds they were looking at. We're looking at Willow Creek and then we're looking at the Northern Leds. Um, so we can compare, they have different type of intensity, so we can also compare what happens with uh, the different, different burn intensities. Um, Okay, I talked about that. I wanted to show a, um, a two-minute video of management. I don't know if you connected to the, to the internet. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's not important. I just, I just wanted to show management activities at the Willow Creek.
but it's just a really quick video showing you some of the management activities. So we have um, seeding and uh, mulching activities post fire, um, where they have helicopters just flying. Oh boy. This is some right, so this is a narration in the background, but right? so you have like all these loads and they have a whole system where they you know they, they just fly in that helicopter comes in, they have the the seed and mulch treatments and they fly out and they, they just dump them. You know, in, in the fire impacted areas. This this is Willow Creek. This is where we're doing doing the, the modeling. Six, six to ten minutes, so it's just it's a very very efficient system. Yeah, mulching and seed. So um, the mulch to sort of protect, you know, to provide cover and protect the um, the land from erosion and then the seeds to re re uh, rejuvenate. Yeah, about kind of six minutes. We're going to see if we can model some of the effects of these <laughs> these things. Anyway, so that, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, and I'll take any, any questions. So if anyone has any, any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Post fire. 
I mean, that's that's a thing that's seen. You almost you almost guaranteed to have more right now. And that's because your soul water dependency goes up. When when you have the fire, the the, the you have a change in the chemical properties and and what we are beginning to see is that your soul activity just goes up because the contact angle of the water with the soul soul surface goes um let's see, it goes down. Or it goes up. Where it, go, it goes up. So you, 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 the soul nat naturally repels water. So any water that comes, any rainfall that comes down, just has a tendency to just go on the surface. But that that usually um, occurs within a year, within like two to three years after that, the soul recovers, and then it, it goes back to like a pre pre fire conditions. Um, the second question. Yes. So, yes, you don't see the bad severity in this. And, and um, what what the core is actually trying to do is they're, they're looking at different soul types. So it's, it's ongoing work. They're looking at different soul types and then they're bringing these soul types to, to use repellency to try to get values of selectivity that we can then just take in and plug in. Um, to be able to calculate what what the impact of infiltration is, um, I think that that was so it's it's data that it's a database that is being built to be able to account the insecurity. So my question is, what is the That's that's the yeah, that's that's the whole I guess that's the beauty of it, so that makes our life easier. <laughs> and and uh, this research actually is a collaboration among a lot of federal agencies and other
，用海椒那个用用,用水的方法把那个泥沙给弄到下游去嘛，有好几种方法。那么大家在用拧门和毛豆做计算的时候，我发觉很多人就是每个人就做 their own way 啊，有时候一些不合适的毛豆他们也照样拿来用啊，不知道这个毛豆有什么哪个特性。然后发觉也没有什么嘎一嘎啊，每个人都做自己认为对的事儿，所以呢，我就觉得我要写一个嘎一嘎，啊，告诉人家，呃，你如果有一个具体的 reservoir 需要用呃塔胶的一个 flushing 的话，你应该选择合适的用来怎么来做计算，啊，所以我所以告诉人应该怎么选，怎么做，啊，就主要是。这这三十分钟啊，给大家介绍一下我这个 report 里面一些内容。啊、那么我想对台湾来说，你们尤其是水利署这里，你们有很多水库，这个泥沙的问题是非常严重的啊。因为我们在这里已经跟水利署合作了快二十年啊，我知道这个这是一个很大的一些，尽管这些年我已经没有在做这些东西啊，我知道你们这个还是应该有兴趣的啊。所以我大概先讲一下。哎，我大概会先讲一下白的光啊，大概介绍一下这个海椒的孵化性的各种种类。尽管你们也许都知道啊，但我假设你什么都不知道啊，呃也没关系，你坐在这里就可以听懂啊。我把介绍一下，然后呢，有什么样的数值数值模型，有各种种类的数值模型，你可以用来做这个海椒的孵化性 modeling， 然后再讲解一下，大概总结一下。一些个案例吧，啊，怎么选，并且呢，给一些具体的案例给你看看，啊，然后我就结束。那么这个你们都知道啊，我也不用说太多。其实台湾的问题比这个严重太多了啊。如果从整个世界的角度来看，那么我们这个水库对泥沙的淤积哈、啊、是非常严重的啊。这个这个数据，这个这个这个这个数字哈、啊，其实是。别，当然从别的 report 里来的啊。基本上，我们的水库的存水量，这个容量一直在减少啊。早些年的时候从，从啊建了很多水库啊，一直增加全世界总量啊，水库的蓄蓄水量。呃，那么从大概八十年代开始，尤其从西方开始啊，慢慢的水库不让建新水库，台湾现在也基本上不让建。因为台湾实际基本上是跟着西方在往前走，啊，那个所以一直在下降，啊，但是这个下降的原因我们都知道，主要是因为 r e s e r v o i r sedimentation 的问题，啊，对吧？你慢慢慢，你要不建新的，然后你的水库因为 sedimentation 越来越少，啊，就把你的数字放在这里，所以泥沙的问题呢是很严重的，这个就算在在在呃台台湾是肯定的，啊 ，reclamation 多少年他们那些。那些领导啊，他们都是政治家偏多，他们不知道这是一个问题啊，所以我们我记得我们 group， 尤其是我们以前那个 group manager 啊 ，Tim Randall 他来过这里好几次啊，呃，一直在 push 啊，一直每年都要都要跟跟上面的那些 politician 的领导，要告诉他们这个 sedimentation 问题其实很严重，你如果现在不考虑，你现在不做 something， 这个以后啊，你。要花你更多的钱去做，并且呢，再做起来就可以越来越难啊！现在就要考虑啊！所以这么多年下来以后，最近一些年，我们垦务局的那些领导终于开始重视啊！所以我们现在我们国务合作也有 sedimentation 的水库的泥沙淤积的问题，变成是一个很重要的项目。现在啊，每年我们也投资不少钱来做研究。这早些年他们都不看，所以这里是随便我是举些例子。这个就算是把很危险的一些 reservoir， 其实都已经你的泥沙淤到一个地步，基本上把你的呃水库基本上没什么，没没没办法蓄水蓄蓄水了。那么在过去的话，很危险一般不管，什么时候开始管了呢？但是这些例子在这里啊，那个取水口全部闭掉了。嗯，本来这个水库跟水流就是拿去某一个地方的水呃呃 district 呃呃农田呃呃用的。那那你这个就闭掉了以后水出不去了，这下他不能不管，但是呢他管，啊这些例子都是我们现在可能局就花很多的钱，那你有什么办法？这一一遇上你就马上要解决问题，那你你你不管多少钱你都往里投，那就找人来 drain 是吧？你
直接把它挖掉嘛，是吧？这个是马上就解决问题的。已经走成这个样子了，你还有什么办法呢？对吧？那么当然怎么办？其实呢，在这个完全被这个水库被泥沙完全给堵住之前。其实这之前已经应该一直在要,要有三度门的难度，这个水库的泥沙泥只要做点处理啊。这张图其实是从那个苏米啊，我大概来过你们这很多次啊，那个日本的教授啊，苏米他破的很厉害，我很喜欢这张图，所以从他那里借来用的啊。那个各种方法我就不用说了哈、啊，这个你要把泥沙弄出去嘛，就反正小孩都知道好吧？要不就，呃，他没进入你水库之前你就把它搞走，对吧？台湾也是这样，很多你在上游建了很多 check dam。或者说，在这之前你就把它 diversion d 啊，就就把它给拿走。那个我记得水石门水库，我当时也做了很多年，我那个毛主席就是做那个巴尔塔斯塔诺，现在已经都 constructed 完的 operate 了，对吧？那个如果一旦进来了，那怎么办呢？一旦进来了以后，实在没办法，你 dredging 总是永远没办法，但是那个是很贵的啊。我知道台湾里面好几个水库一年。一年三百六十五天每，每每天二十四小时在那里转啊，然后花多那就是要花很长花钱啊。那另外一个办法，其实呢，在没有完全淤积之前，那个泥沙如果进到你水库的话，这个是我要套，有个叫海角的复拉性，三维啊，海角的复拉性，就是你如果进来的时候，你如果有足够的水可以用，那你就把闸门排沙的闸门打开，对吧？那。让水流，呃，让让水跟泥沙一块的，把把泥沙带走，啊，这个就是我的所谓的海角复拉性的方法。当然，当然，这个台湾，我我记得你们石门水库也是我一直在 work 那很多年的话，这个 density current 是一个很大的项目，做了很多工作啊。如果进来的泥沙是是一个是一个 density current 的话，那个跟那个不是 density current 的做法是完全不一样，呃，技术是完全不一样啊。所以台台湾。你们是花了很多力气在研究这个问题，这个水龟所，我记得你们有一个 lab 啊，那个 lab 做了很多这个物理模型啊，做了物模的那些结果，其实我也就把那个结果拿来，我用 numerical s r t 去算，啊，就比较啊，可以算的很好。那么这就是我的 topic 啊，已经预计的太晚了，平时就可以时不时的。在机会合适的时候，啊，可以哈掉那个复拉性，所以它的定义就是，定义就是牺牲一部分水库的水，如果你合适的去 operate， 把这个水让通过直接用水就把泥沙带到下游去，如果水不是问题，那这个是最经济的方法，最省钱的方法就把泥沙给弄走。所以这个是广为使用的一个方法，哎，那么如果要分分类啊，如果我把它分成三类，一个叫 draw draw down 复拉性，什么意思呢？如果你一个水库有足够的水，你可以剩，你可以把所有的闸门都打，你这个有全部打开，就让相当于把水库里面水可以全部放掉，那个水位越低啊，我们学学。学海角那个都应该知道，你水位越低，带出去的泥沙量就越大，这很简单的道理啊。但是呢，你浪费的水也，你需要的水也更多，对吧？所以这个在 draw down， draw down。当然，你如果百分之百 draw down 的话，那这个相当于你这个水库就不是水库了啊，就就就相当于是条河流，对吧？所以可以把泥沙全部带走。当然也可以 partial draw down， 因为因为你可以控制的嘛，呃，到底。要多低？那这个决定都是根据你的水对你多重要，对吧？有些水库，呃，你这个水你很你主要当那那那，那水，比如说美国我们西部很多水库那个水是拿来，呃，民用的啊，工业用途啊，农民用的，你可不能把它全部放掉。那个水是很贵的时候，那你就没有选择，对吧？你只能 partial draw down。如果再贵的时候，你连 partial draw down 都不能用，你只能用 pressure flushing。pressure flushing 的是什么意思呢？你保持这个水库的水面跟原来一样，你并不没有把水库的水漏下去，你只是在水库的最低的地方开一些小小的这个门，啊 ，gate， 能够把泥沙带出去，啊，这就叫 pre pressure flush。所以这两个的区别，主要的区别是水库里面的水位，你要不要把它降低，啊
啊，如果降低的话就是 draw down， 啊，呃，不降低保持是高位的那个就是 pressure b l o c k 你完全使用说这个水库的底下越深的地方，它就是压水压越高，通过这个压力把那个能够把那个 sediment 给弄出去，嗯，当然还有呃 density current， 啊，但是我 prefer 叫它 turbidity current。这个是 turbidity current， 就是如果是泥沙就叫 turbidity current， 是 density current 的一种。所以有两种、三种方法可以去做哈，主要主要的 flushing 啊。啊，另外我要定义一下这个 terminology 啊，因为有些时候我我我原来不是不学泥沙的，我就记得后来去看那个 paper 论文的时候，哇哦，一会有人用 routing， 有人用 flushing， 有人还用别的这个 terminology， 我都不知道他们在讲什么东西。所以我要给它重新定义一下。对我来说，如果用 routing 的意思，就是你要让那个呃 sediment keep it moving。什么叫 flushing 呢 ？keep it moving 的就是泥沙如果从上游进到水库，我不让它沉淀下来，啊，就直接让它就就就走下游去了，啊，这个叫 routing。如果我是 flushing， 是讲到已经沉淀在水库里面的东西。我要让它 resuspend， 让它那个要 e r o d e 起来，再把它送下去。这样的话，这两个名词就有区别，并且我,我用这个名词的时候，你就知道我在讲什么啊。一个叫 routing， 一个叫 flushing。所以这些你们都知道啊，我也是很简单的。In case 你不知道呢，刚好上一堂课，对吧？那个如果是 draw down， 不管是呃呃呃，不管是 partial 的还是完全的 draw down， 那么呃，如果你原来这个泥沙啊，这德尔塔已经发展成这样了啊，你至少可以把泥沙去把上面的这些给带走一部分。不过可惜的是，不一定每个水库都 work， 对吧？有些时候很可能你这样做，呃，只是 create 一个新的一条河，一个 channel 啊，很窄的。那么以前这个水库里面，比如说这两边的层的泥沙你也带不走。那你怎么知道呢？啊，这个你就需要知道啊，它到底你完了以后，它是一个很窄的，还是说它可以来回走来回走，变成变成很大的？这个就差别就很大了，对吧？多少泥沙可以带下去，对不对？呃，这个方法是能够 remove 最多的泥沙的一个方法，哎、呃，所以我这里说是 most effective， 哎、呃，可是呢？并不一定经济啊，并不一定所有的呃水库都可以这样做的。我刚才说过，为什么？因为这个可能会用到大量的水啊，所以这就为什么一般 draw down flushing 主要是用在很小的，呃、还是讲叫它水库吧。一般我 prefer 中文的水库是指大大东西啊，这个小的那种小的你，中文有你们有更好的名词吗？不叫水库的啊，小，因为也有很多。我我不知道这里啊，美美国的话有很多这些蛋，其实都是很小的啊。它唯一的用途就是，其实呢，就拦起来一下，是这样的话，他们可以有一个出水口，可以把水引出去给农民用，很小的。啊、有没有别的名字？蓝荷叶，蓝荷叶是一个啊，切蛋啊，英文叫切蛋，那蓝荷叶就可以是一种啊。那个因为呃，它不大。它不大的话，那个水你全放掉，你一弄回去，说不定不要一天，它又回去了，所以不是什么大问题啊。你要是把石门水库全放完的话，那完了的。你看到，石门水库就是一个例子，你不可能用这个方法啊。一般呢是中小型的蓝荷叶啊，这种呃小小水库哈、啊，可以这样做。什么叫 pressure flushing？ 我刚才已经介绍过什么叫 pressure flushing 啊。这个水位你保持很高。你只是在最低的地方开个口，哎、啊，这个方法用水量最小啊，大部分水库没有问题。比如说你什么水库，就可以用这个方法啊。可是任何东西都是有缺点，有优点就有缺点。这个问题呢，你水用的少，那缺点在哪里？你能够弄出去的 sediment 也很小啊，一般会只是在你的门口。前面 create 一个空，空中文叫，我们是 ice cream 的空啊，一个圆锥，圆锥
这可以给你们接。那么远处的 sediment 你都没有发生，所以这就是它的缺点。可是很多的水库就这样做就够了。为什么？包括这些 check tank， 因为我我我我唯一的目的我不是为了蓄水，我的目的是能够有足够的把水位抬高到足够，这样的话水可以引出去。这是第一，第二，我唯一的要求就是我的我我如果一个 gate 在这里，我的 gate 不要被堵住就好了，对吧？所以 pressure flushing 你在一定的频率下每年做个一次或者两次，呃，要做多少次你都是可以用纽埃尔方程可以算的，你只要保持你这个 gate 前面是 clear， 你的目的也就达到。所以呢，这个 pressure flushing 其实也被广为使用，一个方法。但是这可能，我刚才说过，这很复杂。台湾你们很多大水库都有这个问题啊，石门水库是其中一个啊，因为我我刚我比较熟啊，这个是是这个细沙从上游进来，哎 ，for some reason 它进了水库以后啊，它会 plunge， 会沉到底下去。哎，尽管如果当然一般来说这个发生在台风的时候你也看不到啊，如果台风都比那天真的看的时候啊，你还你还不一定看得到。你还觉得哟，这个石门水库水挺清嘛？你都不知道其实底底下这个啊，这很多事情在发生啊。因为这个这个 sediment 呢，铺上去了以后就沿着沿着这个河呃水库的这个呃床啊，就一直 move。你设想一下，如果你 exactly 知道它什么时候 move 到你的 gate 面前，你在趁那个时候帮把底下那个打开，啊，这个不就都跑出去了吗？啊，所以石门水库呃就是做了很多工程。就是希望能够做到这件事情，可是呢，会不会有 density current？ 如果会的话，它它的速度是多是多少？它什么时候跑到你的 gate 前面？你什么时候该打开？哎，这个你你就不一定知道了。然后有一个办法，当然你测量手段高的话，你可以去测，哎，那另外一个办法，你们那个毛都可以算，哎，三十度就可以算，哎，算的也挺好。所以，所以不管你是在用 drawdown， 还是在用 pressure flushing， 还是用在 density current， 那么你有很多问题需要问，对不对？嗯，是没电池了吗？我们总是想希望能够达到怎么样？最后我们目标就是要能够达到最大的 flushing efficiency， 最大的效率。呃，其实呢，简单一点就是能够用能够用最少的水，能够 flush move remove 最大的 sediment， 这个就叫效率 efficiency， 这就是我们的目标。可是，你定义这个东西很容易，这个目标也很容易讲，怎么实现你的目标其实并不简单啊，因为这个 efficiency 哈，有很多很多的因素决定。我就留在这里，我不一个一个一个去去去念啊。但是因为有那么多因素可以影响你的 efficiency， 你想想看，那不是可以靠你坐在办公室用脑袋想就可以啊？这个。你要吗？就有足够的测量的手段，能够在你的水库里测量足够的数据，你能够回答这个问题。在怎么样？呃，你的你的那 gate 应该开在什么地方？在什么样的条件下应该怎么开？开多大？呃，什么时间开？开多久？啊，像像像像我们可能那些有一些地方，它都有有十二个 gate 在那。那十二个 gate 都开吗？还是说只开六个？这六个有没有一个一个怎么开？啊，哎，这些问题你你都不知道。但是呢，你如果有 numerical model 可以做计算，因为那么复杂，这就为什么我们需要数字模拟。你如果用 numerical model 把所有的这些因素因素都可以考虑在里面 ，numerical model 给你结果，根据这些结果。你就可以决定怎么样
操作，怎么样？如果是建新的话，要建新的店啊，什么水库就是不在建新的东西的时候，建在哪里？这个量应该多大啊？你都可以做决定。没有数据你是啥决定要做不了，你就摸黑啊，你就随便做一个看看 work 不 work， 不 work 以后再想办法重新花钱重做啊。所以这个就是你飞行这个是最大的。我的 focus， 因为我其实不做测量啊，我也不会测量啊。现在尤其有台风的时候，我也不想去测量啊。有一次我跳到河里就被冲走了，还得让人家救起来。这个以后我就再也不去了。我说掉下去这个，我哪天就死在那里了。因为那天差点死在那里。所以我就说你们不懂。可是，一说你们数值计算的时候，问题就来了。那有很多模糊你可以选啊。啊，我们把它结论嘞。啊，你也可以啥毛都也不做啊，你用一些古古代的时候没有你们的毛的，那怎么办啊？那些厉害的工程师，他会 develop 一些方程供你用，那也比坐在办公室凭空用脑袋想好，对吧？这是一类啊 i m p r i c a l 的方法。其实现在这个方法现在还有人在做,做大量的 research， 在 develop 这些 i m p r i c a l 也可以。当然，你还可以做一一维的模型的计算啊，也可以做二维模型的计算。你还可以做三维模型的计算，啊，我想一维跟二维大家都比较熟了，啊，一维已经用了不不知道多少年了，啊，二维现在开始 ，finally 开始在美国广为接受，啊，这个我记得我二十年前到了美国的时候没有人用二维，我问他们为什么不用二维，他们说这个算不了，啊，但现在我回头看看那个时候也几乎没有好的毛组可以用，啊，那现在没有问题，那三维大概。我知道连博士是个三维的，好，你的 p h 的论文是不是就在 i m p e r i a l College 那边读的？你的 p h 是哪里念的？在交大。在交大念的？嗯，我怎么拜读过你的论文？就是做 CFA。我写英文的，我写英文的。你写英文的啊？是因为你呀，这个我们都是用三维的出生的人啊。我是从三维开始，最后降到二维。二维人家二十年前我的很多信说我们不做二维，太难了。然后我就降到一维，一维做了一年，我就给你 board。我说一维还有什么好做的啊？我再回到二维。所以现在是一维、二维、三维全部有。可是你怎么知道？给了你一个问题，给了你一个水库，比如什么水库 ？Density c u r r e n t 你怎么选？用一维的，还是用二维的，还是用三维的？或者干脆我就用这个现成的，你可以可以可以选。对不对？所以这是一个很大的问题啊。呃，我这里有在说什么吗？哎呀，对，唯一想说的这个我已经说过了。所以这个需要一个 guide 吧？怎么选？那么我后来发觉，这样的 guide 呢并不存在。这就为什么我写了一个 guide 吧？啊，这个今天给你 talk 是没啥我的 guide 吧？来，谢谢。所以我的目的就是有一个 guideline， 然后 r e c l a m a t i o n 啊，我们其实有 one D model， 呃，我们有 one D model， 当时给完了的原因就是一维的 code 很多，可是能算 segment 的几乎没有，啊，所以后来写了这个 one D 的 model， 这不是我写的啊，是我们我的同事，那个是我们这个 one D 的 model 用了很多年以后，那个 h a c k r e s one D 才把。才追上来的啊，才把 sediment 弄进去。那么到了现在为止呢，基本上大家都用呃，王迪一般用 h y p e r r e s 啊，呃，几乎没什么人开始用 SH 王迪了。一个很简单的原因是因为 SH 王迪哈，它没有这个 graphics front end， 那个每个 cross section 都要人自己手工去弄的。像那样的东西谁去用啊？但 res 就很好用，对吧？它会发展很好的 graph。那么二维在我们俩肯定当然应该是对的，所以我很早就意识到我的二维不需要别人愿愿意去用，你必须要有 graphics 啊，这就为什么后来跟 Apple 啊合作这个整套的 SMS， 可是后来又发现人家说没法用啊，要花钱买啦、啊，所以我们又花了很多力气啊，要他们这个你搞一个不要钱的啊
，否则的话你要钱的话，你怎么怎么样子别花？很多人不愿意花钱哈，反正我是不愿意花钱啊，我是气。这个我能用不花钱的，我绝对不要花钱。那个，其实呢，你们大概都不知道啊，其实我们还有 S H C D，S H C D 其实呢，我们用它来算过石门水库的 density curve。不过呢，这个 code 现在没有在外面给人用，因为因为我自己的 passion 啊，写完了以后发觉都已经，既然是三维的了，这是我昨天好像提到过哈，这 hard 就 static 的三维，那那那何必干脆就用 CFD code？ 所以我自己的 passion 是这个 u t o r a n s 呃，是三维的 CFD code， 没有再做任何假设。理论上，一个 code 如果它解 C， 解 n a v y s t o c k s equation 的话，它就是最简单的。理论上它是没有任何的上限，当然不是理论上，实际上总是有，但是它是最精确。所以呢，我先给一个 general 的答案吧。什么时候要用一维的呢 ？Draw down。你如果 draw down 了，如果是 fully draw down， 那整个流动就相当于河流了嘛？那一维一维绝对是 work the very well。像这样的情况，你再去用二维啊，好像你在浪费时间了。啊，所以一维还是很有用的。啊，这个，哦，呀，来，这张的，呀 ，OK， 看，但是你一定要知道。当你用一维的数字模拟的时候，能够回你的你，它能够解决的问题都是 rich average， 所以你不可以说，哦，我同有人就会用用一维的矛盾告诉我，哎，就在这个地方，野柔性是比如说五米，我说你肯定是 say 的，你只能说大概在这个点的方圆多少个公里之内，这条河段可能平均。可能会有，你不能精确的说是在哪个地方会有，因为这就是王平的 nature， 它是 rich average 的 scale， 它不是告你告诉你 local 的在发生什么，它最大的优点，快，很快就可以算，所以呢，你如果你要算什么一百个一百 mile 或者一百公里一百公里的河段。哦，甚至你想算三十年、五十年、一百年，有人还算一千年的话，那 one D model is the only way to go， 对不对？但是我今天当然讲这个讲的是 reservoir， 一般都是 small scale， 所以呢，倒是不是问题啊。small scale 的，但是你一定要知道它的局限性啊，它的优点就是快。其实呢， narrow， 如果你的 reservoir 是一个比较窄的 reservoir， 那我强烈建议你就不要用来上。完美就行。什么时候要用突击呢？假如，假如你的 reservoir 不是 narrow，reservoir 本身很宽的，或者说沿着这个方向它会变，那不一维就不行，对不对？第二个我放在那里，又不过分，没关系。来，另外一个就是。呃 c a b r i d e curve， 你一定要用二维啊。原原因是呢，我先不讲啊。往一维的那些都是，呃、你算了还不如用 Inverse 可以行啊。那么另外一个我这里好像没讲啊。二维的还有一个优点，就可以比较 local 一点，它不是 rich average。嗯。但是就算是二维，你还是不能是指到一个点。嗯。一个点说哦。算出来是 s c a l a 可以 remove 五米，不要这样告诉人家啊！你至少可以告诉人家，算出来平均大概是五米，但是呢，如果加减个，那加减个三米，因为因为 sediment 的毛都本身非常 incredible， 哎 ，exactly 算出来五米这个数字 too much， 但是有没有毛都哪一个东西你可以比较有 confidence 告诉别人呢？这是我一直告诉人家的，比较。哎，这是现在的情况。假如你做了这个工程，我可以告诉你，这个地方的有柔性可以增加百分之三十。哎，这个你比较可以看的
，你不要告诉人家弄完了以后我可以扫野楼性两米，那是绝对值，不要弄汤的。但是破三节节你可以汤的，有些是破三节节就够，是吧？我现在现这个是现在的情况。假如你做我建议的这个工呃改进，你这个地方野楼就可以扫百分之三十，啊，这个是你们这个毛的最大的用，好吧？用相对值。Relative comparison， 这个比较这样子。二维的当然有它的缺点，如果没有缺点的话，谁去用一维啊？啊，当然最大的缺点就是，呃，没法算。你说你要算一百年，是、no, 吧？有些时候我们要算一百年，你不能用二维，所以它计算量还是大了一点。啊，但是呢，对 reservoir 来说，空间不是问题，啊，主要是时间。假如你要想知道的就是这个一年之内的，甚至两年之内的二维可以啊，超过十年的你就不要想二维，好吗？三维 ，pressure flushing， 我看到有人做 project 的 pressure flushing 用一维的二维的，我今天告诉你这样的东西你就知道那是 garbage， 硬干不下，那是不可信。如果是 pressure flushing， 你只能用三维的。连上去抽底都算不出来。这个我记得我开始我们有可能先有个 project 就在我们呃我家边上十分钟有一个水库啊，那个是 Army Corps 拥有的，我们跟他们合作，他们出来了很多数据，然后我要准备算那个 pressure flushing。呃，以后如果有时间哈，我可以秀给你看。长话短说，我让我那个同事，呃，本来我是目的是让他给我产生用 SH 产生 SH 抽底的 match。他呢倒是很积极，麦序产生完了以后，他也就去算了，啊，算完了以后，那个结果跟那个实验数据差的太大了，差了一百倍，对啊，哦，他就很沮丧，都不敢告诉我，啊，他以为他做错什么了。后来他没办法，他告诉我的时候，我笑了，我说那好，我说你如果算对了的话，我就知道你在，你跟我撒谎，<笑>因为这个 pressure flushing 二维怎么可能算得出来呢？我也没有，原来我也没有让你算啊，我只想让你用二维产生一个麦序。因为我的三维，我的 Uterans model 是用二维的 mesh， 我只是让你产个 mesh 而已。我说你这狗我还去算了，我说还好你没算出来，算出来如果对的话就完了，所以你骗我。呃，三维当然也可以用 density t o p o l o g y 但是现在我发现，其实 SH2 的计算单呃 density t o p o l o g y 更好，更好不是、呃、是因为它没有计算，三维的最最大的问题是计算量太大，好吧？然后现在几乎没有什么三维的 model available， 除非你花大钱去买 commercial code， 啊，那个所以暂时三维能用三维的情况还是很美的，它主要是计算量太大，再加上软件，你能用的软件也没几个，呃，你要用的话，你要花大钱去买，啊，所以希望我们以后，我的目标一直想改变这个状态啊，能够把我的油突然搞成像 S H 处理一样，人人可以用啊。呃，但是呢，因为我自己太忙哈，这个我技术层面呢，啊，只怎么把它搞成一个让别人能用的，只是另外一件事，可能是要花时间。好，我看看时间，我有时候讲太慢了哈。这个又走，这个是哦，这个可以走，啊，不能放。所以我的答案呢，我就快一点哈。好，我们不浪费时间，我就快快。呃，呀。这个我大概都记了，我的嘎一嘎拉基本上跟你也讲差不多。你如果是 draw down 的话，一般来说要么就是王 D， 要么就凸底就够了啊。之前我已经讲过了啊，我这个都写在这里面，你们自己去读啊。那个王一一维二维的，我是觉得它是有缺点啊，但是要么就一维，要么就二维啊。draw down。如果是 pressure flushing， pressure flushing， 那你就必须用三维。CFD model， 还专门做三维 CFD model， 连 hydro、hydrostatic 的 3D model 都没用，是错的。呃，还有什么这个需要讲的？呃，我快快的勾勾思路一下几个 case study 啊，这个我们比如说 l a c r i m a t i o n 我们的 pure 这个 r e s e r v o i 全部被堵死了。所以我们现在的 conversion 呢，当然先花钱把那个挖出来，因为要供水嘛。但是我们现在在想一个 long term， 要解决这个问题，就是泥沙怎么办啊？所以我们做了很多，这个就是个 narrow reservoir。所以我们就用 SH 往里滚
，哎，不是我做的，我的同事啊，做了很多这个研究啊，这个分析，然后怎么改进，然后他们有新的方案，他们新的方案说怎么改进，我们就把他们新的方案再放进来来比较，所以有用呃，去 optimize， 所以这是一个这个这个 project， 那我也就不细讲了，一一也不是我做的，我时间好像也没有了。另外一个是 drawdown。case 对，呃，是我们这个在有一个叫 Climax River 丹尼姆河啊，那个当时我做了一个 study 啊，这个抓的，但是这个呢，它不是 narrow 的，你没看这个，交换啊，这个这个区比较不是不是一个很河流，所以我只能用二维，所以我就用 SH2 去算 ，case。嗯 okay. 哦，呀，你看到没有？我给你一个 animation 哈，当我开始 draw down 的时候，你看到这颜色在变哈，其实也柔性 ，sediment 就从上游开始也柔性下去，哎，所以二维毛都可以算出来。你看到没有？算完了以后，你看到一个什么现象？这个 draw down 下去以后，能挖开来的就一条南河，一条河啊，它并没有办法，它并没有办法说。整个 area 的 sediment 都可以模糊掉，所以你们从毛都证明给他们看，你 draw down 大概能够 create 就是红颜色的就是 yellow 型的河可以挖出来。呃，有意思的是，我把这个算完了以后，对呀，我这个算完了以后，他们那边的 area office 给了我另外一张图啊，就是这张图下面，他说 amazing， 你算出来的结果啊，跟我们这个照，这张图是什么图啊？这张图就是他们当年在这个水库建水库之前的河流，什么意思啊？当你捉到了以后，最后的野柔性野柔性完了以后，这河流回到什么当年，就像丹贝尔模糊掉一样，回到这个以前没有水库时候的状态，这也挺有意思的啊！一看哇，那就证明我的纽兰克毛的应该挺对的嘛，因为以前这个河既然是这样做，因为它道理嘛。啥东西都不变的情况下啊，对我做那个东西最重要的是回答一个问题。我们当时真正要问、要用这个 SH2 去算的，他想知道当我们 draw down 的时候，有多少泥沙，就是流到下游，因为在美国这个是有控制的，你 draw down 太快。太多的泥沙下去，那些就浑很浑的水跑到下游的话，那肯定要告你了。你把下游的什么水鱼啊搞死了或者什么哈，所以所以所以所以这个纽曼顿矛盾，我们基本上就在不同的情况下告诉他，你如果在你设计这个 draw down 的情况下，最大的比如说最大的这个水的 concentration，sediment 的 concentration 是多少，算出来告诉人家，有没有违规？就是，否则的话，你这个呃水就不能开太大。你们说猫的主要是回答这个，这个就是你们什么水库？当年这个 b a s i l i c a r e n 啊，这个做的其实挺成功的啊。这个 video 当然是你们水水利署给我的，是这个这边卖弄一下给你们看看啊。呃，但是呢，我这个是。
的次序，它现在的 existing condition 是一个一个开，先开中间的，再开这里，啊，你反正五个一个一个开，开完了以后，这个就是算出来的结果。你看这个有漏性就限制在，就限制在门前，对吧？呃，但是呢，因为这些，它没法。因为因为他没法测量这些石膏啊，算对不对不知道，但有一个事情他可以测，测什么？他可以测下游的那个 sediment concentration， 啊，所以这就是我的流通量的 model 跟他测出来的比，啊，一个一个打开的时候，所以结果都比的挺好的啊，我从一时间我一直想写，我呃一直想写写个 paper 哈、啊，但是一直没写，对，留在这里，嗯，所以 take home message 就是。其实现在因为要为上面的 numerical model 都 available 了，啊，流通关系尽管现在还没有 available， 但是呢，我希望，我希望希望我一直想做的，这是我我这个东西没做完，我不会退休的啊。这个因为这是我的真正的从年轻的时候的是我的 baby 啊，这个我最后想我要退休之前我一定要让它让大家能用，这个已经全部在那里，嗯，呃，这些 model 都 available 啊，然后我都已经。你们如果需要，到时候把我这个 report 交给国委，国委可以 distribute 给你们啊，细节你们可以去读啊，也可以根据这个 i d e l i n e 可以选。那么一维毛的、二维毛的，你现在都已经有了啊，以后争取啊，争取 utilize 毛的也可以 available 给你们用啊。呃，所以以后就记这样一件事情就行了。你的水库这个 sediment management， 你可以用毛的和毛的可以做很多很多你想不到的事情。哎，我刚才没讲的是那个，我们的 Cherry Creek Dam， 我用苏里尼毛豆算完以后，我告诉他们，你以后每次 flood 不需要五个门就打开，三个就够，可以省五分之二的水，但是挖出去的泥沙是一样。比如举个例子，以及怎么开门，怎么开，先开哪里，把这里埋个毛豆算得清清楚，他可以去试，啊，可以改变他们的 operation。我就停在这里，时间关系，好吧？呃，如果有问题，不超过两个问题，好吧？呀、yeah. ，呃，像这个 Utilize Model 这个在图形的时候问怎么处理？呃，网银行一问就是厉害的问题哈。现在 Utilize Model 没有去算 Free Service， 因为算 Free Service 将会使这个 model 慢过头。太难，所以一般人用，说、so, ，因为我的流通量是毛的，我希望能够在 laptop 上才能放，不需要随口喊过的。那么，那 free service 怎么来呢？你觉得怎么来比较好？如果它不算的话 ，SH2D。所以我一般是 S 先放 SH2D，SH2D SH2D 的结果直接连到 u t i l i z e u t i l i z e 用 SH2D 的 free service 去去做三维。这样的话，这个流通还是可以在 laptop 上的，你的 PC 上就可以挂，不需要随口喊对吧？那个你一旦加了 BOF 以后，你声音就死了。啊，你们别忘记，没关系，我们这个不要管，谢谢。我想请问一下，就是说地中流可以用二维来处理，做计算是啊，算它的地中流。所以你的问题是我提的说，不管是用右维还是二维，你想知道的是那个排沙的效率。因为我想知道，一种浓度它是从下面浓度比较高，到上面浓度比较低，它会是会分辨出来，比如说二维就能比较好，就是使用是用选择。很好的问题哈，不是三维不能算，三维理论上就是最精确的 model 啊。但是呢，我其实用三维去算啊，那个我的 PC 乱动啊，时间太长了，给给你一个结果，你要等上三三个星期，比如说，你愿意等吗？我已经不能等了啊，是这个问题，所以呢，只能用我建议用一维或者二维。那么一维二维是怎么做的呢？它是那个 layer average， 啊，这个一中流管一中流自己是一个 layer， 上面的呃 clear water 是自己管自己的 layer， 所以呢，这就多你要有一个 empirical equation， 啊，底下的这个在这个都在 code 里面跟你没关系啊 ，code 它会 handle 啊，这两个 layer 之间有 exchange， mass exchange， sediment， 如果有 exchange 的话，它要用一个 empirical equation。三维就不需要啊，三维这个是把你算出来，它怎么交换？因为这个，呃，很难算
，因为三维你要把它算进，你要用呃，我当时试的时候，原因就是你要用很多很多 match point， 你不能用 cost match。你说哦，那个我要等三个星期，那那么我就把 match reduce 的五倍好了，那不就算得快了吗？不要，你要这样去算，那个结果你不可信，还不如二维的，呃，一维二维的好。所以主要是 CP 有一个问题，如果哪天出出一点毛病，没有 CP 计算时间的问题的话。Everything is necessary. Yeah. 回答你问题了吗？呃，他所以所以他的意思就是他会自己那个判断他的那个一中有的分层，还有新水的分层。对，对，二维、一维都是这样啊。他那个这个分层的在哪里，他自己可以算出来。但算出来是 again， 因为这是 based on 那个 empirical equation， 那个 empirical equation 是错的，那算出来也是错的。但是根据我们在这个什么水库做的啊，算的非常的好。非常，就因为他算的非常的好，三维的没有 improve 他，我花了，但是我还是乱了，乱了一个月，比如乱一个 case 出来，跟二维的一比，哎呀 ，S 也没有比 S R T two 算的更好，那他用三维干什么呀？是是这个意思。谢谢。好，我就时间时间停在这里，呃，因为下面的时间要 break right， 然后呃 ，start we take over to for the rest of the class。好，我们休息。一分钟好了 ，ten minutes， 对。Okay. okay, good afternoon, everyone. For the last topic of this training, we are going to talk about bridge tower. But first, I wanted to remind you or highlight some of the resources that I told you about. On Tuesday, because I'll be referring to them. So, uh, Guo Wei should have given all of you a PDF file with these resources, and there are several highlights, so links, um, hot links through this that you need to have access to. The one I want to highlight is down here. So on additional FHWA modeling resources on our, on our, our hydraulics page, you can't read this, but in this list right here, there is a link to all of our Federal Highways publications in PDF format. And one of those is our HEC 18 document on bridge tower analysis. Very important. Okay, so I want to make sure you know where that is. So again, if you use, if you go to this link to our hydraulics page and go to the quick links, the publications, you'll find all of our Federal Highways documents online. Okay? And if you can't find it, call Guo Wei. All right. Yeah, then he can. He'll sell you a copy. Okay, so let's talk about bridge tower. So these are the reference documents that you need to be familiar with, and that is on our Federal Highways Hydraulics page. First of all, HEC 18, most important. If anyone is going to evaluate bridge tower, you need to have a copy of HEC 18 to understand where the, what the variables are for. Also, HEC 20 is our document in, on understanding stream stability. Okay, stream stability is the ability of the channel to migrate laterally as well as vertically. So HEC 20 will help you understand and get a better idea of that. HEC 23, I say, I say hey, HEC, H-E-C, that's a hydraulic engineering circular. H-E-C 23 is our design document for countermeasures or riprap okay, to prevent scour. Again, very in, three important documents. And then HDS 7, that's Hydraulic Design Series 7, is an overview of bridge design and hydraulic analysis. And so all four of these documents are on that web page that you have a link to. And I think you will find these to be very, very useful. 
Okay, as we talk about Scour, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into the full. We have a three day training course on Bridge Scour, but I just want to make sure you understand the terminology. When we talk about total Scour, there are three primary components that make up that go into Bridge Scour. The first one is this long term degradation. And I think you see a lot of this in Taiwan. This is the ability of the channel to erode and degrade vertically out, uh, outside of the influence of a bridge. So long-term degradation results from downstream channel changes, uh, or what I've seen, possibly earthquakes, uh, other changes that increase the amount of flow. So we always have to consider the long-term changes in a channel even before we get to evaluating bridge tower. The next one is contraction scour. A contraction scour occurs when we take flow in a wide floodplain and squeeze it down or constrict it down through a bridge opening. And when we do that, we're increasing the velocity and the unit discharge. And let's, so I have a question for you. When we increase the velocity, what does that do to the flow with respect to sediment transport capacity? Who could be brave and answer that question? When we constrict the flow, what are we doing to the ability of the flow to carry sediment? Go away is going to tell everybody the answer. Yes. It must increase. Right? When we increase the velocity in the unit discharge, it, it creates hungry water. Right? So where is it going to take that? Where is it going to eat? Right? It's going to take that from the channel bed. And so that's what causes contraction scour. We're, we're contracting the flow increasing the velocity so it has a greater ability to transport sediment, it's going to take that away from the channel bed. And so that's what causes contraction scour. All right, this last one is local scour. Local scour is the scour around piers and abutments. And so that's my next question for you. Does anybody have an idea what causes local scour. So when water goes around a bridge pier or an abutment, what do you think is actually causing the scour? Turbulence. I don't know what the term is in Chinese. Turbulence. Okay. I was, did you, you know, I was looking at Yang and he was looking away. <laughs> <laughs> it's turbulence. So when we cause, and actually in English it's called a horseshoe vortex. It causes the water to swirl around the piers. So that's actually the mechanism that causes additional scour around the piers. And so when, again, so when we talk about bridge scour, we're considering all of those effects. So we have long-term degradation, the long-term changes in the channel, the contraction scour, and the local scour. And so we have to talk, to talk about or consider each one of those. There's another thing that we have to consider as well. In this diagram, the contraction scour, we're only showing it at the main channel. Okay? Do main channels always stay in the same place over the life of the bridge? No, they can move. So when we're designing for scour, even though we're looking at in the main channel, we have to consider the fact that that can move across probably the entire length of the bridge over the life of the bridge. Okay. So even though in this diagram we're, we're showing contraction scour at this location, we have to consider that that contraction scour may occur over at this pier. And those, and those scour components can be additive. 
So whatever potential scour there is at this pier, if we move the contraction scour over to this point, that total scour at that pier could be greater. Okay. So as engineers, we have to use that judgment and decide on whether or not things can move. Okay. Now another thing, when we evaluate scour, at least in the US, this is our, our what we follow, is we try to identify the worst case scour that can occur over the life of the bridge for a up to a 500 year design event. Okay, so that's an annual uh, exceedance probability of 0 0.2. Now, we also encourage engineers to run multiple flows because that worst case scour does not always occur at the maximum flow. Okay? So I have another question for you. Why? Can you tell me a case where the worst scour may not be at the highest flow? Okay, I think you're on the right track. When the flow is higher, the floodplain is bigger, and there may be tailwater. Okay, so when we have high flows and maybe there's a constriction downstream, it actually may cause more of a backwater, so we don't get the highest velocity at the bridge for a biggest flow. Not always, but in many cases we do. So when we're considering bridge scour, we need to look at a range of flows and identify where that maximum scour occurs. Okay. So don't be fooled. As an engineer, we need to look downstream and consider what may be impacting the flows at my bridge. Okay. This is something in the US that has been overlooked for a long time. A lot of engineers just blindly evaluate maybe the 500 year or the 100 year flow and don't consider the impacts of downstream um, downstream bridges and other contractions. Right. So again, we've been pushing multiple flow analyses for SCOUR uh, most recently. And with the use of SRH2D and a lot of the tools we're developing, these multiple flow uh, multiple event analyses can be done fairly quickly, fairly efficiently. I'll, I'll demonstrate that. To evaluate scour in a 2D model, to use our current methodology, we have to identify, it might be, might be tough to see, we have to identify a cross section at the contracted location. So as flow squeezes down through this bridge, that's the contracted section. Then we also have to identify an approach section. And this approach section is defined as a location upstream of the bridge where the flow contraction has not been impacted yet. So there's no flow contraction. So if you look closely, you see these flow vectors. These flow vectors are still parallel with the floodplain. And so they, they haven't turned towards the main channel. Essentially, we're trying to identify what is the representative sediment transport before the impact of the bridge? Okay, so, and this is important because this arc, or this, we're going to have to draw a cross section or an arc in SMS to represent this approach section. So, this is very important to understand. Okay. If we place this section too close to the bridge, we're going to be assuming too much flow in the main channel and we're going to overestimate the amount of sediment that can be delivered to the bridge. Because ultimately when we're looking at contraction scour, we're trying to compare what is the flow in the main channel before the contraction and what is the flow in the main channel after the contraction has occurred. That is going to be used in computing the magnitude of contraction scour. Now, in this case, I've got two separate sets of arcs because we have a main bridge and we have a secondary or relief bridge, an overbank flow bridge. 
and we can use this process for both bridges. Now, this, this is this, the placement of these arcs, and I'll show you this more later on, is important for contraction scour. Now, for pier scour, the methodology we use in HEC 18 relies on the velocity and depth upstream or approaching the piers, not between the piers. And so, if, so you'll see two piers here in the 2D model. We're interested in the velocity and depth combination upstream of those piers. Now again, since channels can move over the life of the bridge, we're not only interested in the velocity and depth upstream of the pier for this terrain. Okay. Now that would be that would be effective for computing the scour potential for only this case. But since we know that terrain changes can occur over the life of the bridge, we look for the highest velocity depth combination upstream of the bridge. Or probably a better way to say that is the highest unit discharge, velocity times depth, immediately upstream of the bridge. And at that location, we use that velocity and depth then to compute the pier scour potential. So again, that's important because we know things change over the life of the bridge. If you don't accommodate or account for that, you may be underestimating pier scour and increasing the risk at that bridge. All right. Now, I'm going to throw all these equations up there. We're not going to go through these. But these are in HEC 18, the HEC 18 document. And it's, a, it's important to understand our current methodology is based on empirical equations. We are doing current research, and Young Lai is involved with this. We're trying to look at how to utilize 2D and 3D models to evaluate the shear, the bed shear at the piers versus critical shear, and, and use that to get a better estimate of scour. So this will change in the future, but for now, all of our scour equations are essentially empirical equations. And I've got these uh, variables highlighted in red because this is the information we need to extract from an SRH2D model in order to compute scour. So just real quickly, I'm not going to go through detail, but the discharges, okay, remember those approach sections that I identified? So at the approach section, that's our discharge, Q1, and at the contracted section, that's Q2, across that width. And these Ws represent those widths. Okay, so in SMS, we're actually going to draw arcs, and SMS will automatically extract these values across those arcs and use them in the scar equation. So you can see a bunch of Qs and Ws for, depth, for discharges and widths, the Ys are the depths at the upstream and depths at the contracted section. For abutment scour, this small Q is unit discharge, which is basically unit discharge is Q over W. Right? So that's it's really this, it's just a different form of the same variables. So that's pretty straightforward there. And then for pier scour, okay, we've got the depth upstream of the pier and the velocity upstream of the pier. And that's all we need to compute pier scour. Okay. Currently, our main pier scour equation does not account for the size of the bed material. It's just an empirical equation that was derived for sand bed scour. Okay. Now, we do have some other equations for cohesive materials and larger bed material for cobble, but this is our primarily primary pier scour equation. So again. The, the, we're, we're going to extract average values for all of these red parameters from our SRH2D model using the tool we now have in SMS. Okay. So here's the steps we're going to follow. In SMS, and again this is in the community version, we're going to extract, we're going to create a bridge scour coverage. It's a new coverage, we're going to draw the arcs, 
that define the approach section and the contracted section. We're also going to draw arcs to define the bank locations, the pier locations, and the abutment locations. And I'll go through an example of this. And then once we do that, SNS will automatically extract those average values, paste them into the hydraulic toolbox that I talked about on Tuesday, and then you can use the hydraulic toolbox to compute scour. Okay. We'll walk through an example of this. So here's all of these arcs that I've been referring to. So first of all, we draw an arc across the bridge section. We call that the contracted section. We draw an arc at the approach section. And then we draw arcs that define the channel banks. And you can either define the toe of the bank or the top of the bank. It really doesn't matter as long as you're consistent at the approach section or in the contracted section. Now let me just explain that. All right, so if we have our cross section, you can define those bank arcs either at the top of the bank okay, or at the toe of the bank. Really does not matter as long as when you get to your bridge section, you've got a bridge, as long as you're consistent. And maybe it gets a little more challenging, but you either you, you know you go to the toe or at the top of the bank. Okay. Sometimes there's some judgment involved here. I usually think it's easier to go at the toe of the bank. Okay. But really, you just have to be consistent because if you go back to the equations, remember it's using the discharge across the total width and, the, and, and the, uh, that width to determine, to determine the unit discharge. I'll walk through an example of this in SMS. So we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But in addition to those bank stations, we also define the channel center line. Okay? And that's not that important because basically it just uses the center line to determine um, the slope in the main channel and determine the location of these sections. But we still have to include that. And then we also define pier arcs as well as abutment toe arcs. And this is basically just telling SMS where these features are so it can extract the correct hydraulic parameters. Again, okay, we'll, we'll walk through an example of this. Also, we have to define the several parameters starting with the slope gradation. Okay? At, a very, at a very minimum, we at least need one value, and that's the D50. The median grain size of the channel bed material at the approach section. So, um, ideally, we have grain uh, size information at the approach section as well as at the contracted section. Okay? But for this computation, we need a grain size at the approach section to determine whether or not the condition is a clear water scour condition or a live bed scour condition. That may be a new, uh, a new term to you. If that's confusing, please refer to HEC 18 um, to, try to get a better definition of clear water scour versus live bed scour. But that's why it's important we need to have that soil gradation. And then once we have that, we can select which profiles from SMS we can extract. Now, in the community version, we'll only be able to do one at a time but you could do this multiple times with different flows to still be able to use this tool in the community version. But in the pro version, you can pick multiples. And then before you extract it, you can also click on view values, and it's going to highlight all the parameters that are available for export. Okay, so if you want to use your own spreadsheet or you want to do some hand calculations, you can click on the, the, the scenario, like say the 100 year event, click on view values, and can, you can view all the parameters. I demonstrated on Tuesday a 3D bridge. If you have a 3D bridge and you select it, it will include that in the plots. But it's not essential for scour calculations. 
Okay? It's just going to include those in the plots. Um, I'll work through some of this other stuff. Let's see, in the demo, here's just a highlight of all the parameters that are exported. Um, I'm not going to read through that. You have that in your notes. And we'll, we'll go through that in the example. And then we'll get to the hydraulic toolbox. It does provide a summary. And then ultimately, it will provide a plot of total scour. Okay. We'll walk through some of these things in the demo. While I switch over here, any questions that you have, uh, just in general questions on bridge scour? Yes? No, nobody in the front row. Hey. What question do you have? <laughs> so the question is, what relationship is used to determine whether you have clear water or live bed scour? Okay, somebody had to ask that. Let's go back. Go back to okay. So here's the equation. So to determine whether there is clear water or live bed scour, we have to determine whether or not the material upstream is moving. So that's why we have our d50, which in this case is d. Uh, we need the flow depth, and from this equation, if the velocity in the 2D model exceeds critical velocity of that material. What does that mean? Since you asked the question. It means the material is moving. If the material is moving, then we have a live bed scour condition. That means that material is being delivered from that upstream approach section to the bridge section. Right? If our critical velocity is greater than the average velocity in the approach truck channel. That means material's not moving, and so we're going to have a clear water scour case at the bridge. Do you use the average velocity? Yes, use the average velocity. That's a great question. Another question from the front row. Uh, well, scour. Uh, for scholar evaluation, so it will be highly dependent on where you draw that arc, upstream arc. Yes. Uh, can you say more about how to select? That's a good question. So, and I'll, I'll go through this in the demo as well. So the question is, if we're using this approach condition to determine whether or not we have live bed or clear water scour, this young gentleman is saying that the location of this arc becomes very important. Uh, right? I'm, I'm not interested in contraction scour. I'm interested in local scour. Go, go back to the next step yeah, here. Yeah. You still selected the red box. Right? It's selected by user. No, no. Okay. That's, that's a good. So, you're getting to another. So, go ahead. Go ahead. In this figure, in order to calculate the local scan, you need the upstream velocity and the depth. The, for local scour, yes. it uses the velocity and depth within this box. Yes, yeah, so who okay. defined this box? Okay, we'll get to that, but I'll tell you now. Um, in the data entry, by default, it uses the length of the pier and, use, and it goes upstream of that length, upstream of the center line of the bridge, that distance to extract the value. But the user can override that and specify it. Can you say it repeat again? Yes. Well, let me, let me actually show you where that is. So, right here, this upstream offset for pier hydraulics. It says zero. If zero is entered, it will use the maximum pier length and ups. So let me draw this. All right. Let's say we have a bridge. We've got piers. Okay. For pier scour, we're interested in the approach velocity and depth. 
And as I mentioned, more importantly, we want to know the velocity and depth at the maximum unit discharge so that we account for channel movement over the life of the bridge. But just for a generic purpose, we want to know the approach velocity and depth. And that's somewhere up here. As a default, when we draw our pure arcs, we found that taking this pure length and offsetting it upstream of the bridge is a good starting place. That's a good default. And so it takes the length of that pier upstream of the center line of the bridge and extracts the velocity and depth from that location. Okay? Unless the user overrides that. So this is a good default. Okay, so, okay. so this is, uh, you just made a huge assumption here. We did, and that's, but it's an assumption that the user can can change. But all we need is a distance. We need the velocity and depth somewhere upstream of the bridge, but not right at the pier. Yeah, all what you need, because uh, during your talk, you are looking for the maximum value upstream of that pier. Not, not necessarily the maximum velocity, not velocity but the unit value. discharge, yeah, yes. You are so, looking for maximum yes. Q. Yes. Why not search not just a point? Why not search upstream in an area to find the maximum Q? So it doesn't. I understand that. It doesn't search by area, but it does search along this line. Oh, now you add more story to it. So it's not a one well, point. So it's actually doing two things. We're getting into the weeds here. But it's, by default, it offsets from the length of the pier and defines a cross-section. And it's going to find the maximum unit discharge along this it's length. not a cross-section. It is. And it finds, let's say that occurs right here. By default now, it is going to extract the velocity and depth at that location. However, it will also extract the velocity and the depths upstream of the pier and provide that data as well. How is it used? Um, it doesn't use this, it puts it in the view values, and I'll show you that. But we made this to be a little foolproof that it uses the, this value, but provides this value if the user wants to override it. We will discuss more because the reason I'm interested in know why. I'm going to do the same. I can do the same thing for full view representation of a larger one. Okay. Okay. You know, that's yeah. why I'm interested in this. Okay. Good. So the main thing we're interested in is we want to get away from the local hydraulic effects of the piers when determining this value. And so this isn't this isn't an exact science. We just want to be upstream enough. And so we think the length of the pier or the width of the bridge is a good reference point as an offset from the center line. Good questions. Okay. Well, what I don't want you to get confused about is this is how we extract velocity and depth for pier scour. The approach section, so the approach section is used for contraction scouring. So the approach section and contracted section are used for contraction scour. What we've been talking here is used for pure scour. But excellent questions. What other questions do you have? Yes.
Yeah, so uh, I want to know uh, your suggestion about the cross-station measurement we need to choose okay. before and after the cross-station. Actually, I think so. Let me let me talk about this. I think I understand your question. Let me try this. Um, right. I think. Let's say here. Let's. Um, so here's here's the floodplain. So let's say we have a bridge. Looks like this. But then we have a, a main channel that looks like this. So the channel is, is not the whole bridge opening. Okay. And so what we do is if, if these flow vectors start to do this, you know, these, we know that when we start to see that the overbank flow is being turned into the main channel, we want to put our approach cross section up there. But when we place our bank stations here, the bank stations are actually defining the width of flow that's transporting sediment. Okay? Because in most cases, the overbank is actually vegetated, and it's the main channel that's transporting sediment. And so we place, even though we're drawing a cross section all the way across the floodplain, when we place the bank stations, it's extracting the hydraulic parameters based on this width, not the entire width of the floodplain. Similarly, at the, across the contracted section, we place our bank stations to represent the main channel. And so what we're evaluating here is this is the width of sediment that's being delivered to the bridge, is we need to know then that same width of sediment transport within the cross section, how is it being impacted by an increase in unit discharge? Okay. So it's, it's a very simple sediment balance. So we, by, by defining this width, we're saying that this is the amount of flow and this is the width of flow that could be transporting sediment. How are we impacting that through the bridge section? Okay. Does, so even though we survey a cross section entire, across the entire width, when we define these bank stations, that's we're defining the main channel and we're assessing how we're impacting sediment transport within the main channel. Does that does that answer your question, or maybe you can clarify? Yeah. Thank you. But uh, I also have another uh, question. Okay. Uh, because um, in Taiwan, the, uh, our father protect, protective tender is, is different for river and uh, drainage. For river in Taiwan, it's about 100 years for green phase. So, uh, because green phase is uh, for uh, drainage, it's about 10 years. Uh, like, uh, but uh, when we uh, calculate the, the pier scout, yeah, in Taiwan, uh, uh, depending on the capacity, the, uh, the magnitude of river or uh, drainage, but uh, it's also related to the protective, protective center. Yeah, so I want to know the discharge, you, uh, as you uh, say, uh, 100 years or uh, 50 years or 10 years. Yeah, it's also very important, so maybe you can give us some suggestions. Okay, let me uh, so sort of go back to this slide. Um, if I if I heard you right, you have if I understand the question, for different scenarios you have different design criteria, correct? So if you're evaluating scour for a ten year event, that will be different for obviously than say if your criteria is a hundred event hundred year. Um, but it, it, there may be a scenario, and I'm not, I'm not sure this gets at your question, but it may be, in some cases, that the 10-year scour is greater than the 100-year. Depends on the, the, the hydraulics and, the, and the, uh, the scenario. Depends on the scenario. But, and that may be. We're saying if, our, if we have a 100-year design criteria, that's saying what is the maximum scour up to 100-year, no matter where it occurs. Okay. I don't know. Um, 
Do you have, can you help clarify the question, or am I missing the point on that one? Uh, my 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 question uh, because uh, uh, in Taiwan uh, we in, uh, we usually uh, take the protective standard for drainage is about ten years about flood frequency, but uh, for river in Taiwan is about one hundred years. Okay, but how does that relate to scour? For if your drainage yeah, criteria so is ten years, uh, yes. Uh, if we, we uh, take the high high uh, uh, that we take the 100 year frequency flood, uh, it could, uh, maybe it's very con conservative for the night in Taiwan. Yeah, but uh, uh, because uh, due to the protective standard of uh, different scale of uh, river in Taiwan. Okay. Yeah. So. So you say for different rivers, you have different design criteria. Right. 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 Okay. So I want to know your suggestion. Uh, because it's also related to the cost. Yeah, we want to, uh, uh, because the, the depth of the pier yeah, is very related to the, the cost of uh, the right. construction of the bridge. So, if I understand you, you're saying for some bridge designs, you only have a 10 year design criteria? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, in, uh, in Taiwan, if we, uh, if, if prone to the uh, drainage, drainage, yeah. Uh, so, sometimes we also, we use the uh, protective standard about 10 years for small oh. river, for small river. But uh, for big river, maybe 100 years or 200 years yeah. for different different uh, protective standard. Yeah. You want to say something? No, I'll just ask you. Right. Uh, maybe I would say, uh, I'm not a great scholar designer, per se. Uh, I, I would say the best way is using this tool to find the worst case scenario. Right. Instead of demanding that it's a 10 year, 20 year, 100 year, 500 year. Just like you said, well, it, it's 500 what, year may not be the worst case. It, it's, it's really what risk are you willing to take? I would say a, a 10 year design criteria for a bridge foundation is very low. You're, you're accepting a very high risk, and, and it's still probably a very high cost. I would, my recommendation, that's a, that's a really low design criteria for a bridge. Now, in the, in the U.S., we, for our interstate, our highway bridges, we typically design for a 500-year end, okay, for stability. For secondary bridges, or let's, let's say low-priority bridges, um, forest service bridges, you know, one-lane bridges, those maybe might be as low as a 50-year design event. But a, a 10 for a 10-year design event for a bridge is it's a really high risk. Because if you look at it, look at the statistics. For even a, for a hundred year event, I might have this wrong, but I think it's something like if you have a hundred year event and you assume a 75 design life of a bridge, there's a 40% chance that that of that flow of flood will be exceeded over the life of the bridge. That's for a 100-year design. You can imagine for a 10-year design, you're almost guaranteed, your, your percentage of that, that that's going to be exceeded is really high. So you're, you're taking on a really high risk for a bridge foundation. So it's, it's something to think about. Um, you, when you're considering human life, you know, basically human safety, we want to keep that risk as, as low as practical while still optimizing the cost. And so, again, consider, is it, a, is it an important access route? Is it an emergency access route? Um, are you willing to take that risk for that bridge? So usually what we've found to design for at least a 100-year event, um, the cost is, is more but the cost of replacing that bridge every several years is much more. Uh, yes, uh, so my, my friend, I also have a question in the United States. I am wondering if the, the bridge located in the rural area or the city area, mm -hmm. uh, you will choose the different uh, protective standard for bridge scouting. So we do. Um, I will tell you, in, in the HECA team document, 
in chapter 2, write this down, there's a table, table 2.1, for risk-based design. And we'll, it will actually show you that for lower um, standard bridges, maybe more rural bridges, we might go as low as a 50-year event. But that's, that's pretty rare. Usually it's 100 or greater. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it really comes down to who the owner of the bridge is and can you accept that risk. So, again, to say it's a balance of risk and cost. We've experienced this. If you have to replace a bridge every 10 years, the cost of that and the cost of that road being closed can be very high. We're, we're finding um, in the U.S. the topic of resilience has become very important. And so we're finding that it's better to over-design initially. Not only does that improve the safety for the traveling public, but it reduces the long-term project. Okay, great questions, thank you. Thank you. What other questions do you have before we get into a demo? Okay. I can tell you in the US, we've seen many bridge failures. And it usually is a result of not considering the true hydraulics over the life of the bridge and changes that can happen to the river and not really assessing the amount of risk that we've taken. And so it's, it's important to put the time into evaluating the proper hydraulics and also understanding the bed material, understanding what we're putting the foundation into and tr correctly assessing the scour potential. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's do a demo. project in Kentucky in the United States and there are two bridges just give you a look at what this looks like here there's a, a main channel bridge and so that's what it looks like it's got it's a three span bridge with two piers and then we have a, a relief bridge over in the side and we're going to evaluate scour for these, well, we'll mainly just look at the, uh, the main bridge. One thing I want to highlight while we're talking about scour in, in, in uh, two different bridges is that um, for main channel bridges, we evaluate whether we can have clear water scour or live bed scour. And that's, and for main channel bridges, that's usually that either one can occur. But for relief bridges, so bridges that are in the overbank, where we have vegetation, rarely do we ever see sediment moving in the overbank. And so I can tell you that most structures that are not on the main channel are going to be operating in a clear water scour condition. Okay. Even if we see some sediment movement, there's usually not enough consistent sediment movement to support a continuous live bed condition. Okay. So when you're designing or evaluating bridges, if you have a structure that's not on the main channel, you can usually assume that it's, it's you can assume that a clear water scour case is, is present. Okay. Alright. So let's go to plan view here. Turn off the image. All right, so the first thing we need to do is create this new bridge scour tool or a coverage. So we go up to map data. I'm going to right click and select new coverage. And we've got a specific bridge scour coverage. And we can rename that, but I'm just going to leave it called Bridge Scour. And the first time you run this, it's going to pop up this help menu. You can click on Workflow or Bridge Scour Help to get more information on how to draw these arcs and, and how to walk through this process. 
And this is the, uh, I showed you this dialog before, we'll come back to this. But for now, I'm just going to click OK. And we need to draw these arcs. So again, make sure that the bridge scour tool is active by clicking on it. And then make sure we, we're going to turn the arcs on. But first, uh, let's see. I'm going to turn off the bridges so they don't get in the way. And I'm going to click on this arc. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to draw an arc left to right looking downstream. And if you can see, that's going through. See the two piers, the holes in the mesh? So I'm going to go right through those piers. So this is my contracted section arc. So basically it covers the entire width of the flow through my contracted section. Now it might be helpful to turn on, I'm going to look at the 100 year event. I'm going to turn on the velocity data. Now I'm also going to, let's go ahead and go to the display settings and turn on my vectors. So we can see the direction of flow. All right, so now also one thing that um, this, this tool does automatically is assign the type of arcs automatically. Let me show you what I mean. So if I go back to the bridge scour tool, go to the select arc tool, and I select this arc, I can double click or I can go to the arc attributes. And you'll notice that it's identified as a contracted section arc. You see that? that it did that automatically if I draw them in a certain order. But if you draw them in a different order, you can just come back and you can correct that. You can select whatever the appropriate type is. So this is a contracted section arc. Now, but the next one, and again, if you, if you click on that workflow box, it'll tell you the order that it recommends drawing these in. And I'm going to follow that order. Now we go upstream to a point where we know that the, it's upstream of the influence of this roadway. And you can see somewhere, somewhere up in this range. And there's, it, this isn't really, it doesn't have to be exact, but I'm just going to draw a section across here. And now what I want to do is you'll notice I only want to span the flow that's going to this bridge, not this bridge. So can you see the point at which this flow, this kind of separation zone, right about here where this flow goes to this bridge, this flow goes to this bridge? And so I want to draw that arc across that, just the flow that goes to the main bridge. And so I'm going to draw it about there. All right, so that's my approach section arc. And again, if I... If I select on this, you'll see that it identified it as an approach section arc. Okay. This is important because these definitions will be used when it extracts values for each of these locations. All right, next I need to define a channel center line. So I'm just going to draw, uh, it has to just in, capture both of those cross sections. It does not have to be exact just enough to cross both of those sections and be approximately down the center of the channel. Again, if I, I select on that arc, it has called it a, a channel center line. Now, I'm going to turn the velocities off and I'm going to go back to viewing my contour data. Turn off the flow vectors. And it's also helpful to turn color fill with linear contours on. So if I zoom in, and now I actually may want to move this cross section a little bit. It's good to be perpendicular to, to cross the cross section somewhere close to perpendicular. So I'm going to zoom in here. And now I'm going to define bank stations. Roughly, I can either go at the top of the bank or at the toe of the bank. And you can see there's kind of a distinctive toe down here, or maybe even down further. I'm going to back it off just a little bit. Draw it there. And I'm going to draw it over here. Now, the, the, I can tell you 
the direction and lengths of these arcs don't matter. The only thing that matters is where they cross that approach arc. And the only thing that these arcs are doing are defining the main channel from where it's going to extract the hydraulic parameters for the scour pool. So that's the, the approach arc, and then we do the same thing. We go down to the bridge. And now this is, maybe it gets a little more challenging, is that there, there's a main channel and a secondary channel here. It's pretty rare that sediment that's moving is going to actually take a, a 90 degree turn and go down a secondary channel. So we're going to assume that this is the main channel over on this right side. And we're going to pick locations that generally represent the toe of this slope. And so those, if you look at that, those are both being assigned as bank station arcs. If, if, if we drew these in different order, again, you can reassign those as needed. Um, the next arcs, I believe, are the abutment toe arcs, but let me, I'll, I'll just, maybe I'm wrong. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the piers. So the pier arcs have to follow the piers. So the, the pier arc length, angle, length and angle are important because they will define the geometry of the piers and the approach angle on the piers. So this, this, this is important, and I can show you this. So I can tell you, here let me show you one thing. If I go to display options and I turn the legend on, well, it's kind of hard to see here, but this legend will show you the different type of arcs and what they mean. But I can show you here, if I, if I select on this, and it's supposed to be a pier, but I select it and I edit it, oh, it thinks it's an abutment toe. That's wrong. So I can correct this. I can tell it, nope, it's a pier arc. Now for the pier arcs, we have to define the pier shape, whether it's square nosed or round nosed, or if it's a group of cylinders. So we might have a group of cylindrical piers. In this case, it's a sharp nosed pier. And the pier width, I believe, was three feet. Okay. And the pier length, this is the length of the arc, but I know the pier length is actually 42 feet, so I can override that. And we're going to reference the main channel hydraulics. And then this also, for design purposes, we could override this angle of attack. Now this is important. A 2D model is going to automatically compute what the angle of attack is for this pier for computing scour for this condition. But if we want to account over the life of the bridge, how much that, you know, whether that can move, we can enter an override angle here that might be, say, 20 degrees. Okay? This is very important if you have a long wall pier. If it's a cylindrical pier, it doesn't matter. So for this case, I'm going to assume an override angle of, of uh, 20 degrees. Because scour for skew, skew piers increases significantly. And then the pier bottom elevation, this is just for plotting purposes. I'm going to enter a value of four, 420 feet. Okay. So I do, it, I do that for this pier. And I'll do it for the other pier as well. Draw an arc. And I make sure that it's set as a pier. It's a sharp nose. Pier width is 3 feet. The length is 42. I'm going to override that with 20 degrees and a bottom elevation of 420. That. Now I have to draw arcs for the abutment toes. And this is another arc that the location is not that important. I'll, I'll explain that again. So I'm going to assume that the abutment toe is here and make sure that's getting an assigned as an abutment. So it says abutment. And then also you have two choices a spill through abutment 
or a vertical wall above it. And this is a spill through. So I'm going to do that for both cases. So now that is, those are all of the arcs. If I turn off the mesh, you can see what that looks like. So again, just to review, we've placed arcs drawn from left to right looking downstream for our contracted section, for an approach section that's upstream of where the bridge starts influencing the overbank flow. We've drawn bank stations that represent either the top of bank or the toe of bank at both locations. We've drawn arcs that represent the piers and the abutments. Okay. Now, once we've done that, we go back to our bridge scour coverage and right click on that and we go to bridge scour properties. And now we enter all the information. So we start with a, a gradation. And you tell it how many points you have in your gradation. And I know for this it's just one point. So you hit one point, and you can hit tab. And this diameter is in feet. And let's see. I know it in millimeters. I, um, Oh. <laughs> it's 1.5 millimeters. 1.5. You want to do the math for me quick, then, Ben? You can set this in millimeters, but 0 0.07 and 0.8. Well, he's doing the math. With the software in the near, we can calculate this. <laughs> and we have a hard time. To I usually work in feet. <laughs> um, and so the pers while he's doing the math for me, the, the percent passing is from 0 to 1. And this is 50%. So we have enter 0.5. Do you have an answer for me, Ben? What is 1.5 millimeters in feet? Zero zero four. Okay. Zero zero five. Okay. So again, at a minimum, we need one point. But it, there's also benefit of having a D eighty four and a D one hundred. But that applies to other calculations. So at a minimum, we need one. So we click OK, and then we need to tell it which mesh. We only we have one mesh, so it's existing mesh, and then we add scenarios. So I'm just going to add one. So I'm going to click on, I go down to the 100 year. I click on Q100, and it's going to import all of the information. So it's already populated that. Um, it assumes the last time step if you're running a, a, a steady state. But if you're running a hydrograph, you can pick a different time step. So we're just going to go with the last time step and click close. Uh, we do have a bridge deck, so I can pick the main bridge. And then the ups, this is that upset, <laughs> offset for the upstream pier hydraulics. So remember, my pier length was 42 feet. If I leave this as zero, it's going to, it's, what it's going to do, it's going to use a reference point that's 42 feet upstream of the bridge center line to extract the pier hydraulics. And we think that's a pretty good, pretty good reference point, so I'll leave that. Okay. Now, I'm not going to get into this in detail, but we have multiple abutment scour methods available in HEC 18. We have determined from our research that the method that we call the NCHRP method is the best method based on current research. And it's the only method that's available in this toolbox. So without getting into too much detail, there are two types of scour conditions that it's considering. 
If you have a bridge abutment that's relatively close to the main channel, and it might be close over the life of the bridge, we always use the scour condition A. Basically, what that's going to use is going to use average main channel hydraulics for computing abutment scour. If you have an abutment that is set way back in the floodplain, that is only going to experience overbank hydraulic conditions over the life of the bridge, you would select scour condition B. But that's assuming that that main channel is not going to move into that abutment at all. So by default, we always start with condition A unless you think it's different. Okay. Um, yeah, that's enough I'll say on that. More information is in HEC 18 on that. We actually spend a fair amount of time on that in the SCOUR course. All right, for the output then, you would just pick an output file. And we just can just call this, let's call this SCOUR demo. All right, hit, uh, hit save. Then you export the data to export finished. And before I do this, before I go anywhere, remember I said there's a view values? If you click on that scenario, click view values, this actually opens a data file that will go through, it will tell you all of the hydraulics at your approach section. Okay, so it will tell you your energy grade line slope, your total, total flow, and then it breaks down the hydraulics by main channel, so between your bank stations, and it'll tell you your left over bank, your right over bank. Okay? And so these are the values that it's going to use for um, contraction scour. And so your main channel, and then it's got your contracted channel. And then also, it's got your abutment scour data, but what I want to highlight here, because of Young's earlier question, so you see, at each one of the piers, it's identified the local approach depth and the local approach velocity. But it's going down and below the pier summary, it says highest unit discharge. That's the highest unit discharge. And it, here's the stationing along that upstream cross-section where it's found at. And so it's going to use pier design velocity, in this case, 5.2 feet per second and the depth at that location. So these values are what are actually transferred to the toolbox for design. But if you want to know scour based on local conditions, you can take these values and manually enter them into the hydraulic toolbox. So real quickly, we're almost done here. When you click export, it takes all those values and exports to the toolbox. And if I open up the, the toolbox, if you click on this button right here, Launch Hydraulic Toolbox, it runs the hydraulic toolbox that's already in SMS. You see the bridge scour analysis here. And um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can walk through. You've got contraction scour parameters. It's, it's automatically populated these from SMS. So you can see that it's it's computed a scour contraction scour depth of five feet. So it's taken um, all of the values from where we place those arcs, and then we scroll down. It even extracts the water surface for that flow. Uh, you can see the here's the pier information that it's extracted. Here's the velocity, the depth, the length, everything. And so then also for the same thing for abutments. If you click on bridge summary table, here's all the values. But then you probably all want to see the plot. And here's, oh, uh oh. I messed something up. So here's the resulting, oh, I picked the 500 before I export, exported the 100 and the 500 year. But you can see here's the original channel bed. And since we selected our bank stations over the main channel, it's only applying contraction scour 
within the main channel, even though we know that this can probably migrate over the entire width. But it's picked that, it's plotted that there, and it's plotting the scour as well. Who can tell me why the pier scour on this pier would be so much greater? It's not a trick question. What, what factor could make pier scour so much larger on one pier versus another pier? And this is actually something I, I maybe messed up. In my example, I showed you I fixed the I fixed the approach angle to 20 degrees. In this example, I did not. But in this example, the actual approach angle is much higher. And so this approach angle is driving the pier scour to be much greater than this pier. So I just opened a different file than the root first one I exported. Uh, and then this this also shows the above as well. That's a lot. What questions do you have on the bridge scour tool? Now, let me just highlight this. Everything, I want to go back and show you this. Think about what questions you might have. But I highlighted this earlier. Oops. So what I just covered in the last hour this bridge scour workshop covers in eight hours. So it's a lot more information, a lot more detail, and you click on that hyperlink, it will take you to all the recordings as well as additional handouts. So, because what I just covered in an hour was, was a lot of information. So I really would encourage you to, if you start to do scour analyses, to spend the time and go through the full eight hour workshop. Or talk to away. <laughs> well, anyway, that was an overview. I, I hope that was somewhat helpful. So maybe it scared you before you uh, ever do scour analysis. You better uh, understand what it all includes. Okay, a wonderful presentation. I think the start had run out at all the times. So. We can have a quick, quick question. Anyone have a quick question? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's lunchtime, right? Uh, here I have one quick question. Yes. Yeah, I know that you computed the scour by the integrity cost formulation. Do you think it's possible to directly apply to Taiwan bridge? So the question is, using the empirical equations, do they apply to Taiwan bridges? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they, they, they could be conservative, because in our empirical analysis, it's, it's like an envelope curve, and we're, 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 on, we're usually the upper end of the envelope. But if you characterize the soils correctly, utilizing in the contraction scour equations, or if you have cohesive materials, we have cohesive um, pure scour equations, cohesive contraction scour, I do believe that it would be appropriate. I just think a uh, different combination was comes out with different results. Uh, in Taiwan, we have developed a lot of the skull empirical formulations. Okay. Yeah. But the, the, the computed scout is totally different. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you, uh, you know, so, so that, can be directly used in, in, in our, our bridge scout. So what, you have data to show this? I have a lot of studies uh, that develop the, uh, the I, w I would be interested in seeing that, because I, I don't see, I don't understand, I wouldn't, I would not see a reason why our methods would not apply to conditions in Taiwan. It should apply, and then one more thing, Usually, every case that I have looked at where there's a there's a discrepancy, it usually is a that the hydraulic conditions were not represented correctly, or the terrain was not represented correctly. 
but there's usually some engineering judgment that went into the calculation that was not representative of what was actually experienced in the field. Okay. Um, I, I think I, I think I can talk about this issue later. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. You bet. Okay. So now we have the training option. So let's hear it for our special guest and the whole of you. Uh,